Hello and welcome. My name is Alfonso Barrera and I am the founder of Hispanic Pro. Hispanic Pro is a Hispanic professional network dedicated to promoting business networking and employment opportunities for diverse professionals. Our mission is to connect Latino professionals to corporations and most importantly, to each other. Thank you for joining us on this special day as we bring a close to Women's History Month with today's webinar, which is Women Who Lead in Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. We are joined by extraordinary professionals who are subject matter experts and play an important role in helping foster a diverse, equitable, and inclusive culture for their place of work. Get engaged in today's conversation by submitting questions for our discussion panelists in the chat room and network by dropping your LinkedIn profile in the chat room as there are recruiters who are joining us today. I would like to introduce you to today's moderator, Jessica Gavazos. Jessica began her career journey in politics and has worked her way up from campaign scheduler to congressional aide to being an award-winning community leader. Jessica developed leadership skills that would propel her to the office of the presidency of the Wisconsin Latino Chamber of Commerce, and most recently of the Wisconsin Economic Development Foundation, which focuses on helping to mobilize Latino populations through business development and workforce optimization. Empowered by seeing people thrive, Jessica has been a strong advocate in improving quality of life issue for diverse populations in Wisconsin. Jessica has, was recently appointed to service at the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors and is the mother of three children. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you, thank you all. I'm Absolutely. so happy to be here. Yeah, thank you, Jessica, uh, for being our moderator for today's webinar. Jessica will continue the program from here and engage in today's conversation with our distinguished guests. I will return before the end of the webinar to close the program. Jessica, it's all yours. Wonderful, thank you so much, Alfonso. And I'm so happy to be here with all these wonderful ladies who are really catalysts in, in the DEI field. Uh, we are here with women who lead in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I, I, I'm gonna just start this, I wanna just have this informally because I wanna learn more about each of you. And I'm going to start with Samantha, and I just tell me a little bit about what you do, who you are, and what drives you. Yes, yeah, so Samantha Maldonado, born and raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I currently work at Coles Corporation as a senior manager in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so I joined the organization during the pandemic, so definitely one open to change and managing through change. Um, but what drives me, I would say, is being able to play in the sandbox in a way that we can always question what if, what can we do, and why not? And so it's a matter of, again, considering business transformation, thinking through change, and bringing people along with you as you consider of what's possible to make our community that much better and have everyone have a seat at the table to make the conversation that much richer. I love it. I love the message. Carla, on to you next. Tell, tell us what drives you and give us a little bit about who you are. Thank you, yes. Um, first, I wanna thank Alfonso and of course, Jessica for having us here in Hispanic Pro. Um, I work in marketing and communications at NRG Energy. It's a Fortune 500 company that generates electricity, provides energy solutions and natural gas through our diverse retail portfolio of retail brands. Um, in my role, I support corporate and business divisions. And I work with multiple stakeholders such as um, plan operations, uh, the business group, I work with corporate sustainability and human resources and positive energy. And these two last two stakeholders, human resources and positive energy, our charitable arm, provide us, myself, my team and, the, and myself, the opportunity to, to showcase, to market, to communicate all of the good work that we do as a company. And of course, all of our great talent that, that work with us and collaborate day in and day out. And so that leads me into some of the things that I enjoy the most and what moves me. And it's working with so many groups, so many talented people that are united by a single purpose. And, and that to me, and being able to see the impact, being able to communicate it, that is what drives me the most. And I know we have a vast uh, array of, of locations. Where are you located? I am physically located in Houston, Texas. In Houston, but Texas. We, we, with the company, we have a, a national footprint in Canada as well. 
Right, so international footprint. And on to, to Cecilia Velasco, who is not in the country right now, and she can tell us a little bit more about her. She gave us the, the, the uh, international platform. Uh, Cecilia, bienvenida. Can you tell us a little bit more about you and what drives you as well? Thank you so much, Jessica. And I am uh, so uh, honored to be sharing the, the scenario with this uh, group of professionals and thanks uh, for the invitation to Hispanic Pro. I am uh, Cecilia Velasco, I go by Ceci. I sit as, um, as you said, Jessica, in, in, Mexi in, in Mexico, in Guadalajara. I have been uh, with IBM all of my life and uh, all of that time uh, within HR. And since um, I am going to be three years in this role, uh, I am the diversity and inclusion leader for the Hispanic Latinx community in, in IBM. And um, what is what gives it meaning? I could give you what uh, my job description said, mm -hmm. but uh, I think that the most important part of it and the way that I find um, it meaningful is that it totally aligned to my purpose of making an impact in my, in, in my fellow human beings right? Making a difference, allowing everybody. I deeply believe that human beings are learning beings. We always learn. Even to the last um, minute of our lives, we are still learning. And um, for those of us that believe in that, even after. So um, diversity and inclusion and equity is a space of continuous learning. It is a space of continuous um, curiosity and understanding, and that totally leads to learning. So that is my passion, connecting with people. And I and I can feel your passion right through the screen. So thank you for that. <laughs> I speak no, with you, my hands, so I will be careful not to hit my computer. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm the, I think we're all the same, right? But uh, up next, I do have Sandra uh, Magallon. And, and Sandra, it, it's so wonderful to have you here and, 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 and see you now and hear you personally, because I've heard about you in the past and, and all the great things in your work that you're doing. Can you tell us a little bit more and tell the public exactly uh, who you are and what drives you? Absolutely. Thank you. And so first of all, thank you, ladies, for providing such great insight as to the work that you're doing. And I feel honored to be um, among such not just beauty, but talent and intelligence. So it's great to be part of this wonderful event. Um, my name is Sandra Magallon. Um, I recently accepted the role of the I had the West Division of the Minority Entrepreneur Program here at JP Morgan Chase. The program is part of the $30 billion commitment that Jamie Dimon has made to really help our minority small businesses. And, and my part of it, I take it very personal because I am part of La Villita here in Chicago, which is a predominantly Latino neighborhood. I did help my parents open their paleteria and through many paletas, um, they were able to put all six of us through school and through university and really be able to like accomplish that American dream that we hear so much of. And most of my career, I've spent it in large corporate middle market and really learned a lot about really um, the financial health of businesses, the financial health of the balance sheet, really understanding like how is it that you structure in order to be able to expand both nationally and internationally. And so when the pandemic hit, everything came to a stop. And it, it was really shocking to myself as well as to many. And so this opportunity for the minority entre entrepreneur senior consultant role came about. And um, I was excited to interview for it. And I took it and I've I, I started in September, and as of September, I want to say I've already mentored over 700 small businesses, oh uh, both one-on-one -on -one and through group settings, um, and I'm hoping to duplicate everything that I've done here. I've partnered up with our corporate philanthropic team, um, with all of our internal and external stakeholders. Um, earlier, that's why I was talking with Hispanic Pro with Alfonso, because when I first started the job, I thought, let me have a roundtable discussion with all of the key players in the Latino, Latina, Latinx, Hispanic, whatever we want to go by, community. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt, I felt a little bit of negativity. I didn't know why. So I'm like, let me call Alfonso. And so Alfonso really opened my eyes 
to a number of different issues that we're going to be discussing today. And what he shared with me, I really brought back to the bank and, and, and really helped provide some perspective to the way that we're building out this program to help small businesses in the Latino and, and Black African-American community. So that's a little bit about myself. That's wonderful. You know, in this time uh, that we're, we're in the recovery, I think all that you're doing is, is imperative to the survival of small businesses. And, and, and I thank you and we thank you. Uh, now we're on to Celeste Lopez Bard, uh, Barrett. How are you? And tell us more about you. And, you know, I know we connected before this phone call, the, uh, this, the webinar with uh, information that you want to connect with other human beings like you and, and the work you're doing is so important. So just tell us what drives you and who you are. Yeah, thank you for, for being for inviting me. I'm I'm honored. Again, this is a great pa panel and I really admired each and every one of you. So thank you for the invite. So um, yeah, my name is Celeste Lopez Baird. I currently live in San Francisco. I've been living here for 10 years. Um, a little bit about my background. Um, when I first started here, I felt um, that I had to, like I had to look, there's what, there was like, I had to look some, some, some way, I had to talk in a certain way, I had to even eat a certain way here in San Francisco. So I felt I had to fit in. So you, ha you know, there's some adjustments you do in your life. And then I was like, okay, this is not okay. Uh, I, I, I realize now that I didn't feel I belonged as much as I had to like change and adjust. So for, when you ask what drives me, it's, it's that, it's people, first of all. People like Cecilia, I think exactly like you. I think I, I love the, the idea of connecting people of, because we have so many things in common. More things that separate, more, more things that are different, we have more that unite us more commonalities that we maybe are not aware of, or maybe professionally, we're like focused on just on the ROI of the of the organization. But but this this um, this profession makes you forces you to look deeper, to make create those deeper connections, to learn like like you were saying, Cecilia, to Ceci, I'm sorry, <laughs> to to learn to keep keep uh, educating yourself. And, and that, that's what drives me the most. And a little bit of uh, I, my profession right now, I work with the San Francisco Giants and I'm part of the DEI Council where we, we offer programs and education to the organization. And on the side, I do offer uh, DEI trainings specifically in spotlighting the Hispanic community. And I think we are a, a very, like we, we have some specific challenges and I love providing those specific tools to organizations that want to make sure uh, Hispanics and Latinos are included as well in their, in their workplace. Thank you so much, Celeste. And last but not least, the wonderful Esther Ledesma uh, Pulmanaro. How are you? And, and tell us a little bit about, you know, who you are, what you do and what drives you. Thank you. Hi, Jessica, and hi, everyone. I am more than pleased and honored to be here today, and thank you as well to Alfonso for including me. Um, as you said, my name is Esther Ledesma Pumarol. I am born and raised from Dominican Republic in the Caribbean. I am currently in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Professionally, I am global portfolio manager for um, a product line uh, focused on improving and, and helping patients with heart failure feel better. And that's uh, part of Medtronic. So I'm very proud and, and happy to be part of that big family. Um, in terms of how about me, I feel like, you know, I moved to the US 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago. And after relocating, um, I, you know, Brazilian Latina, ready to jump into anything and everything pursuing my career. And I had the opportunity to evolve and jump into different opportunities to the point that I, um, I was offered, you know, opportunities in different places, different companies and groups. And uh, as I continue moving through that path, it was for me something like it came to a point where I realized the importance of having people that look like me in the room or people that would lend me a hand. And um, 
after that, I think there was like an aha moment, two, three years into, into the journey where I realized the, import the importance of representation. And that literally changed the way I was looking at what I did at my career and really pushed me into getting involved and ignited this passion around inclusion and diversity to the point that, um, you know, as, as many of you probably know, I am part of the Hispanic Latino Network at Medtronic, sitting as the incoming chair for, this, for the Twin Cities chapter. And then I volunteer um, extensively outside of my professional life with uh, community organizations like the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, and specifically here in Minneapolis and nationally. And then um, as well, another organization focused on immigrants called Green Car Voices. So I feel like to me, the, that aspect of representation and ensuring that people, young professionals can see somebody that looks like them thriving, being successful and occupying or making places and space in probably environments that haven't been designed for them is what drives me. So thank you. I'm very happy to be here today. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this while I'm mothering at the chamber. So. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. And you know, a lot of what you said, um, I'll tell you that Minnesota is, is an amazing catalyst for a lot of movements and I love what you guys are doing. And so, you know, being your neighbor to, to the, the East, you know, we're watching uh, the Latinos blossom and encouraging each other and empower each other. And so I really think that, you know, in moving, in moving um, forward and, and added mobility to our communities, we need to be aligned. And so, we're, you know, I'd love to talk to you more offline about what you're doing, but let's get into this. You know, there's a lot of, I, I see a lot of the chats going on. There are a lot of uh, recruiters and talent acquisitions, uh, individuals on the chat. And so uh, keep it coming, add your LinkedIn profile file to the, the comments, but I want to start with how, do, how can a diverse uh, workforce remain visible to upper management and decision makers while working from home? So, you know, now with COVID, we've had to, you know, they, they say the pivot, right? We'd have to pivot and readjust. And so, you know, and this could be to the first person, you know, or anyone who feels comfortable answering this question. You know, in this time of, of, of uh, that we're now readjusting our sales, you know, how can someone who's working at, at home feel like they are still visible? I'll go ahead and I'll jump in. Oh, I'm sorry, Ceci, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, I can go with a nurse, Sandra. <laughs> okay. um, well, got it. Well, Jessica, you know, that's a really great question because I think that we've gotten so used to that human interaction. And so not only have we physically had to adjust, it's also been mentally. And so I think that, it's truly important to see like, how is it that you can create that connectivity without having that Zoom fatigue? Because like my son right now is upstairs doing his own Zoom with his teachers and, and, and he has Zoom dates, which is a thing now. And so it, it's, it's been very interesting to see how we pivot. But when it comes to our careers, I want to say that this is the time for us to raise our hand and really be bold and reach out to leadership. They want to hear from us. They want to hear from us. And so I think that I, I've been receiving a number of different emails from individuals around the firm, from Texas to California, you name it, I've been getting it. And I, I never turn anyone down. Why? Because I want to make sure that I'm providing that exploratory discussion and zooming out and having them zoom out and take a look at what their career is and what is it that they need to work on? What are their opportunities? what are their strengths and what, what's their long-term goal. And so I really feel that the individuals within the audience should feel, should give themselves permission to be bold and to raise their hand. And if they're working for an organization that really is gonna live through the DEI movement, then people are gonna wanna meet with them. Those are great points. Cecilia, would you add anything else? Sure. Uh, I want to, to learn into, into what you just said, uh, to, to build into what you just said. I have been uh, working remote in global roles for IBM for the last uh, 13 years. So when, when this pandemic came, I said, I got this. No issue. I can manage. Of course not. Of course not. All of it changed. Um, so what I have learned, uh, in this year and in the past 13 years, it's 
two things, two key things. One, as, as uh, Sandra was saying, you need to be true to yourself and to your brand. We Hispanics, uh, usually Latinx, we usually don't brag about uh, ourselves. We are humbled, calladitas nos, ve nos vemos más bonitas, etc. right? And that's not true um, for, for, this, for this environment. We need to be true to ourselves and also be intentional on how we use our voices, right? So the first part is we need to make sure what is what we want to highlight in the environments. Having something as easy, one tip is have five minutes prior your uh, next interaction, call, meeting, uh, you name it, and say, okay, what is the point that I want to make that will elevate my brand, right? So that would be one example. So be true to yourself. The other one is to be intentional. What is the intention of you doing something? Revise, review the other tip. Review your agenda for the, the rest of the week. And check what are your appointments, what you are dedicating your time for. Does that build to your purpose? Does that build to your agenda? Does that build to your brand? Yay, no. And be selective. And make sure that you have a purpose for, for the interactions, because if not, um, work and people and everything will come as a tsunami for you. <laughs> and you need to have some, some of that. So intention and be true to your brand. Thank you. Those are wonderful tips. And, and I know that um, I think all uh, Latinos, Latinas, Hispanics, Latinx, you know, I think um, we should be respectful of the title that everybody chooses, right? But uh, one of the things that I would say is um, coming up, uh, and Sandra, going back to your point and what you're saying, Cecilia, too, you know, being intentional to where you want to be and also having others to open doors for you, that was the biggest, like, it was both the biggest obstacle for me, but it was also the biggest gift when I got the right person, right? So, you know, it's really important that you have um, people who, no matter if you're getting the door closed four or five times, that that sixth door is going to actually probably be that person that's going to uh, get you where you where you need to be or give you that right advice. And so when I see all of you, I see as I see you as as that as people who are, are making opportunities for others. And I know there's a lot of recruiters on here and, and talent acquisition leaders. Uh, and, and the next question is basically on that. Recruiters and ta talent acquisition leaders everywhere are being tasked to increase workforce div uh, workplace div uh, diversity. Why is it so hard to move the needle? And is the talent pipeline issues as often argued? So I'm going to give this one to, to Samantha because I know that she, she knows something about this. And, and um, you know, why is it so hard to move the needle forward? Thank you for that. Um, yeah, so I think a lot of it has to be about what have we done and what can we do differently, right? So as we think about diversity recruiting and diversity talent acquisition, it really is where are we showing up? How, how is our brand being received and how are we building our exposure in, into the, the diverse market? So if it's considering HBCUs, if it's considering HSI, Hispanic Serving Institutions, if it's looking locally in your backyard or nationally for national organizations like Prospanica or SHIP or SU, Nabimba, all of that, it's how can we start to build those relationships? And it's not a talent shortage that I think is a very, is a myth. There's many, many um, diverse, talented professionals out there. It's a matter of how do we connect the dots so that as we're showing up to career fairs, as we're competing with other peers within the market or competitors, how are they considering one organization versus another? How is that organization showing up in regards to the values and to the principles and how those candidates can consider themselves aligned to those same principles and values of that organization, right? So too, it's being mindful of perceived bias and inherent bias of the talent recruiters, of those that are in the position of sourcing these candidates. And so how do we train our talent, our talent professionals to think differently about engaging diverse talent or where they're sourcing and capturing these opportunities 
And also as we're doing the interviews, how are we providing questions that are behavior based that are written in a way to remove or mitigate bias as well, so that we're also being considerate of the nuance between different cultural um, sensitivities or behaviors or how people are conditioned. So it's a multitude of opportunity and how we can show up differently, how we can meet our candidates where they are, and also where we're searching for this diverse talent as well. And so it's, again, it's bringing people to the table, diverse perspectives and saying, what can we think about doing differently? Leveraging those um, subject matter experts within your organization that have exposure and have those relationships and finding ways to connect those dots so that diversity, equity, inclusion is a thread that permeates all layers of the organization, not just in sourcing talent, but also growing and then cultivating talent as well. And would you say, and Samantha, that it would be also setting the culture? I mean, because I think it also, oh, yeah with the, yeah. you know, the, the culture, right? Uh, Celeste? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Uh, so no, I was just gonna add to what, what Samantha said. I mean, it's, uh, that's, that's perfect. It is exactly, uh, you know, how, that, that how, how it is, how we should be. But also now, now, we also thinking ahead of like, now you have the talent, you recruited, now what? What are you gonna offer? You have to have ready systems in place. You have to have processes that will make that new talent feel that they are going to be heard that they are going to feel that they belong that they are part of the organization so to have in place ergs have in place maybe a mentorship program give them the tools to be successful if not that talent is going to be it's going to be gone and that's why another that's another factor why the needle can move if they don't see themselves represented in higher positions and if they're not being heard or feeling they, they don't feel that they belong, that you know you you risk losing that all that effort that you made before. So right, and I think that's where the turnover rate goes. I mean, mm -hmm. such hard work goes on to to like capturing that talent, and then all of a sudden, you know, how do you retain them? You know, I think it's what exact ex exactly what both of you said. It's you know putting the processes in place to to make it inviting for them to stay. Right, um, and and going on to to the next question: How can an employee resource group (ERGs) assist corporations in achieving diversity, equity, and inclusion goals? I think you've mentioned that. Or Ready, but uh, Carla, could, could you give us your perspective of, of you know, what NRG is doing? Sure. And I, I'm going to speak first on, on the personal perspective, just because um, I started the OLA Club last year around this time, actually. And um, we, we call it it's the OLA Club. It's our Hispanic and Latino ERG or, or employee or um, business resource group. I'm sorry. And, um, but I'm also a member of many other groups like uh, the, the Running Club, the Women in Power Club, et cetera. And I can see firsthand how they do change things for, for our colleagues, for, for myself even. When I was about to launch the club, I remember that I discussed with multiple groups that, you know, what do you think, or in, individuals that I trusted, what do you think about doing this or that? And I remember hearing different or conflicting advice, you know, be careful, you're going to be seen as a Hispanic person or go for it, absolutely, we need it. And it's always important that you do what you also feel that is right and that, and that you, can, you can contribute. And so part of the, the things that I mentioned earlier was, for me, it's important to, to work for a common purpose and ERGs seem to be able to do that very well. So they provide opportunities for people to come together to express concerns or issues that they've seen that they're living right now at the workplace or in their communities. But what I love more about, about the ERGs is that they provide an opportunity for people to share what they would do differently. And so it's important that we're not all complaining and, and, and showcasing what's wrong, but that we collectively work on how we can make it better. And so when you come together, now you have a different platform to go your, to your leaders and say, this is what's happening. This is what we propose. These are the things that we've seen other companies are doing. This is what we've read and what we've discussed. We've evaluated sometimes even programs, right? And so they provide intel, to direct intel to, to leaders to make better decisions, to make informed decisions. They also provide, quite frankly, a good time, right? You have, you share common interests, you get together for social hour, or if it's a, a sports or well-being group, then you go for a run or you go and explore the outdoors. And so you also have a rewarding experience. And so it's, it's, it's on the positive side being that you, you, are, you have an opportunity to express 
what's going on and to find a solution, but you also make connections, make good friends. I've met fantastic people, not only with, through Ola, but through other groups, like I've said, and you can see how people are so hungry to make a difference. And so they, that's what they do. They enable people to make a difference. And, and so, and at NRG, that's what we're doing, but like from what I'm hearing, all of you are. And so all of you are very involved, very connected with groups and hearing others out, not only the ones that we represent, we're all Hispanic or Latinas or uh, Latinx or however we go by, but it's important that we also connect with others because one group's challenge is not the same as the other, but when you put them together is when you have the full pie, you understand it better. You know, I, I love that uh, because I feel like it's a more holistic approach you know, and I, and I, and I feel like you're, what you're saying, I'm feeling it. I'm like, you know, I would love to be part of that culture where my, where my concerns are being, you know, um, listened to and their solutions, solutions driven. So, you know, I, I, and I'm learning as I'm hearing all of you, I mean, I'm like, wow, you know, ERGs, you know, woot woot, right. So, you know, I think it's a great thing uh, uh, for, to have that platform, you know, for that holistic yes. uh, interaction and conversation. So uh, the next question is pay disparities among men and women are, are uh, or different races or ethnicities can be result of direct or indirect biases. What can a DEI professional do to address and promote a culture of pay equity and career advancement? And so um, I don't know if Esther, if this is something you want to tackle or. Yeah, I can yeah. share my thoughts. Um, and just to recognize to the answers to the previous questions, I was trying to jump in, but I was like, these ladies already have it. So um, um, in terms of equity and, and reducing, for example, the pay gap. And I think for us, the Hispanics and Latinos in general, and maybe even more on the female side, there's a lot of taboo around you know, I cannot share what my pay is, I cannot inquire, I, I, and just a, a lot of, I, I would say, um, misunderstanding around how to navigate those conversations as well. When we sit at the table and we have the power to bring in and share with our leaders those concerns, I think there are two things that are probably the most critical ones. One, accountability from the side of the organization. Because um, you know, we can do all this work with the with the diversity, inclusion, and equity teams and, and bring light to all of the potential gaps and, and all of that. But if at the head of the organization, if our leaders are not connected with the mission, um, there is so much far we can go. And then at the other end, I would say education. And by that I mean you know, us as uh, leaders, as individual contributors, or as team members, let's start learning how to have these conversations with our managers. Let's start learning how to bring up the point in my annual review, how to ask for a raise, how does that relate to, how am I, for, how am I seen in the organization? And even so, how do I compare outside of the organization? What's the market for in terms of my role and my function? And there's a lot of data. You'll be surprised how much data is out there available to every professional around understanding, you know, how much are you making? How does that compare to the people that are doing similar, if not the same thing as you in your industry or in different industries? So I think there's for us a lot of work around, you know, shifting our mind and getting our mindset around. I have this, I, I own my career, I own my path. I can have this conversation and bring this forward. And two, as I said before, in the, on the side of the organization, how, do, how are we held accountable to make sure that we are delivering, right? Because it's not only bringing these concerns and pushing them forward, how are we able to introduce and implement these changes? I think and I would have, like to, yeah. to add something there, if, uh -huh. if you allow me. Sorry, Jessica. Yeah, sure, no, I, I think that, 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 you know, it, 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 Cecilia, just to, to your point, Esther, I'm sorry. And, and what you're saying, you know, I, I just looked it up. It says, you know, um, we make about 45 cents less than a white male in the same position. So, you right. know, it, it, you know, there's a lot of advocacy that still needs to get done on that issue. But Cecilia, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Jessica. I was going to share that in a recent study that we did um, with, uh, you know, different organizations and professionals in the US at the IBM um, IDB, we found out that um, Latinas uh, have to work 20, 23 months to earn what 
men, white men make in one year, in 12 months. We are, we are the, the lowest, com considering the full spectrum of Latinas, right, in the US. So I, I, while I, 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 what I love about what Esther was saying, she was saying about taking own responsibility on, on driving those conversations for ourselves and raising it with data, which I loved. And she also talked about the accountability of the organization. I think that this goes very closely with what we were talking about culture mm -hmm. and, um, and the, the environment and the, and the uh, business principles of the organizations, because this is something that the organization needs to drive at, at overall. They have the information inside to know if they are paying au pair or if they are going um, out of whack, right? They have the information to, to make sure that, well, I, I should say I, because I am HR, but um, we have that information to make a difference. So I think that, um, that it is the time to make sure that women, women of color, um, and, and, and other underrepresented minorities are being seen under this lens. And this is something that the organizations themselves take serious. Definitely. Sorry. No, I love it. And I, and, and, you know, just listening to all the human capital that's in this room, there's no reason that we shouldn't, you know, be equitable, right? I mean, it's, that's just the truth. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to go on to the next question. How did the COVID-19 pandemic and George Floyd's protest last summer change diversity, equity, and uh, inclusion uh, conversations around the corporate structure? So um, let's see. I, I, I want to say that, Sandra, uh, you have an answer for me. <laughs> well, I, I think, you know, it's interesting because um, I, I have to say that it, it, it unearthed what, already what we already knew as Latinas, what we knew in, in our community. Uh, I, I remember walking down Michigan Avenue um, in my 20s and having a group of young white men throw bottles at me and yell different things to me. And I never experienced that in my life. And so I, I felt like what, what just happened to me. So for me, it, that experience made me kind of like really zoom out just to try and figure out why they were attacking me. And so, and it was verbal and hateful. And as we're seeing everything that's going on in the community, in the Asian community, it's things that our communities have already been able to experience or we've experienced it, but it was never at the point where there was a highlight, where there was video. And certainly we've had video in the past, Mm -hmm. But but I but I just think that the extremity of what we witnessed and how horrible it was really unearthed and opened this horrible ugliness in America that for so long abajito de, la, abajito de aquí let's just let's just sweep it let's just sweep it nada pasa aquí and so it was a horrible event that I think led to a catalyst as you said earlier Jessica it was a catalyst that we saw happen in Minnesota that really, I think, shocked the world. Mm -hmm. And the movement, sorry, it just, the movement that we saw of the human and, 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 and leadership really wanting to have these conversations and, and creating safe spaces where finally we felt like we had a voice. And so I think that in being part of the BRG here at JP Morgan Chase, We've had a lot of discussions where no one's going to be um, reprimanded for it. I had a lot of conversations with my, my allies, my allies. So every single individual in my team, there was a, there were different areas of the country and some were very uncomfortable. And they're like, I don't wanna talk about this. Why are you making me talk about this? Right. And I'm like, cause we have to. So I just think that that, that the, the BML movement would happen with George Floyd what COVID has uncovered as far as the inequity within our own social platform are things that have been open and has reared its ugly face when for so long, we just didn't want to talk about it. And now we, now we can. Right. There, Sorry, I think you get all choked up. No, and it, and it's, I think we all get choke up, choked up. I know that I'll tell you that our chamber put like a letter out right away about anti-hate and not 
you know, and, and how we have to align, like, you know, we have to protect all our populations from, uh, you know, from the rhetoric that we've already experienced. Like you said, you experienced, I've experienced it, many people here have experienced it. And, and someone in the chat said, BLM changed the world of DEI. And, you know, that is really impactful because it, it like you said, it's, it made the conversation happen. Because it, before it was like stuffed under the carpet, like, you know, this is not gonna happen. We, it didn't happen last weekend. and and you know, it perpetuates like over and over and over. So we need to like, this is something that needs to be discussed. It impacts everyone. And, and as you see, the corporate uh, corporations are now investing and they're, you know, trying to, you know, change the culture. Celeste, can you share your perspective? Yes, um, I, I, I absolutely agree. I do believe that um, George Floyd on death, unfortunately, I mean, it's just, it did mark the before and after. For, and I can speak and I would like to share uh, with the San Francisco Giants, we had, we've had a council, diversity and inclusion council before, but this was the moment where it's like, what are we doing? It made us have like a, a introspect at what are we doing? Who are we? What do we want as an, organiz as an organization? Um, and we had a, a meeting, a, a company meeting where people, were, were able to express how they felt. It was a meeting that had no time limit. Anyone that wanted to speak out did. Leaders speak out. It, it came from a very genuine place. Um, we, we cried, we felt, we didn't know what our, our coworkers were going through. So it was very impactful. And since that moment on, we, the, our, our initiative has been more, um, more intentional with the strat strategy has, you know, it's, it's much more uh, with a purpose. And we, it, I, I think us as, the, as professionals, it's, we have to make sure this moment, this momentum does, is not get lost. We have to, because what, we don't know what's gonna happen in two years, three years. This, this must keep going, like the sensitivity, the, the desire for uh, executives and leadership to listen, that should continue. We, the changes that are made now, we have to make sure it, they, they, it's just a foundation for a new, it, and it's a new beginning for organization and who we are and we just create now a, a really culture of change. It's gonna take time and as we all know here, we can expect to see drastic changes in two or three years, but this was a really, really big boost, at least for us. And yeah, you know, I I I believe that all that you all are saying um, really was an, it was impactful. Not only COVID did it happened to our country, BLM shook us. And, you know, this is a time for, for us to be united, right? United with, you know, it, it's not just like a, an Asian or a Latino issue or a, a African-American issue. We need to like say, you know what, we stand against hate in its totality. So, you know, it, it is one of those things. I know I cried, you know, I, you know it's, it's very emotional. It's emotional to have, to have that conversation with your children when they're asking you. So, you know, it's really rocked our, our nation. But I think with the work that you all are doing, I think we're moving forward. We're, we're pushing, you know, these conversations and, and equity forward. And that's why it's really, you know, really important. And Carmen says hate shall not be tolerated. And that's, that is, you know, truly what we should all work towards. Uh, the following question is due to recent anti-Asian racism and crimes. Why is it important for America's workforce to talk about Asian American story to the Asian American story too? Who would like to tackle that one? I can, I can speak to that one. Sure. I think just as we speak about BLM and how we speak about the African-American Black experience, this is all part of our United States American history, right? We can't isolate, you know, um, uh, one slice of the story. We need to recognize and give credence and grace to all the contributions and the experiences of all those different immigrants and all the different dimensions of diversity that we have in our country. And it's not just being the the friend in may when we have aapi month to recognize and celebrate that we need to be there and recognize their contributions and support throughout the course of the year not just in the month that it's you know identified and slated for celebration same thing with you know african-american black history month or hispanic heritage month we need to be that that partner that 
that organization that is aligned to say, hey, we hear you, we support you, we are against racism and discrimination and retaliation. And so that also too is, would be beneficial as an organization when consumers are considering us as a place to shop, as a potential employer, as a place for investors to come. And so again, it's you have to speak to your values, you have to decide what you're showing up for and what you're standing up for and be um, apparent in that messaging, both internal to your associates as well as external in regards to that support and that recognition. And again, it, it, it pays off being more than just saying the words and being performative. You have to put policies in place. You have to hold people accountable and you need to have those conversations again to what's already been shared about how can we be here for you? How can we look at our policies and become more anti-racist because it's pervasive and we need to think about what's been done and what we can do differently going forward. But we need to be organizations that create that sense of inclusion again, because if you can bring all the diverse talent in, if they don't feel they have a voice or feel that they are included, they're not going to stay. And then the next evolution to that is creating a culture of belonging where they feel that their success is directly connected and tied into the success of the organization. And so again, you can't be performative with that. You have to show up and have leaders change and broaden their perspectives of engagement and how they engage diverse perspectives for decision making so that ultimately we are starting to move the status quo forward in the right ways and that we consider our diverse talent as culture adds and not just culture fits as we're considering new talent and existing talent moving them through the organization. Definitely and and you know to your point leadership is really you know that that top down mentality where people are you know are not in a, a space where they're understanding their you know, and I've been there in the corporate setting, you know, where they're not understanding their, their, uh, and I don't like to use the word subordinate, but their, their staff, their team, you know, you know, I think that um, we see, you know, I saw this little picture where they showed like, you know, who's in leadership, and they, they showed like the two, two brown uh, faces, and, you know, like other ethnic groups, right, but all the leadership were uh, white men, right, and so, um, one of the things I think that in, in, in that realm and what you're all doing in, in your positions is opening the doors, you know, having more equity, more diversity, the conversation, the, the even the, that interview process, you know, who's out there, you know, seeking. I know that I see it. I, I'm seeing more diversity. And I, and I know this is maybe just the trickling, but, I, you know, going back to the the the. Um, the the period that we're living in right now where, where, you know, our communities really have to be succinct with the Asian community and supporting them. Um, I think it's something that we should resonate in our communities, in our homes, uh, in the co corporate culture that, you know, we have to be united. We have to, you know, we, we have to protect each other. You know, I think our parents went through it. I know my mom went through it. I remember as a child, my mother renting in a really nice area. And the man said, I don't rent, I don't rent to, you know, and, and, you know, to the S word, right? And I didn't know what that was. That was my first time I've ever heard that word that, you know, I thought it was Hispanic. No, uh, you know, and so I, I think that we all have to stand uh, as children of immigrants, as people of color, we have to really stand with each other. So that uh, that takes me to the next question. To the, due, due to the recent anti-Asian racism crimes, why is it so, no, is that the one I just read? Um, the next question is, do you see the companies uh, companies that you are aligned with taking initiatives to help support emotional health and employees during this stressful time? If so, is this help being tailored to the diverse makeup of the workforce? So is, is it, it, you know, during this time where we're having, not only are we having the, you know, the pandemic, but also uh, the need to, you know, for that mental health, I know a lot of us have to, you know, like I'm here mothering during my work time, right? So how do you balance that? And is there programs in, in, within your organizations that are, are tailored to, you know, to people of color, to people who are diverse, you know, who wants to, I'm going to give this one to Cecilia because she... I she... can take it. <laughs> and uh, I will pass it to you, Esther. <laughs> um, I think that uh, it, it is a constant learning pro program, right? It is a learning constant learning process. And um, what we have been doing is, first, we went to what we had and we ensured that everybody was aware of it. We tailored it to the needs that we were having 
first with the pandemic, the working mothers, the caregivers, because it's not only mothering. Some of us are the sandwich generation, right? We are taking care of our aging parents and taking care of our growing uh, children. And with the pandemic, all of our support net been vanished, right? So we went first there, and then with the with the um, hurting of the black community and the uh, Pan Asian community, we went and and focus also funneled some of the resources. Then what we have learned from the process is that we need to make sure that we are continuing to listen. It's what are the cultural nuances for each of the communities, for the mental and emotional. Um, illnesses, but they are not illnesses sometimes. They, they are just um, challenges, right? How they, um, how they uh, conceptualize that, how they show up for that, and how can we provide help meeting them where, where they are, right? So we have been learning through this past year and starting to, to uh, work with our service providers, with external experts, with, um, with firms that are dedicated to these, to do that learning process, to, um, to uh, get, get that um, uh, gap bridged between how I as a Hispanic or how I as a, uh, as a Chinese woman or whatever, how I experience that stress, that issues, that emotional uh, burden, how I express it and how I can get help aligned with my cultural um, reality, right? So I think that it's uh, very important. So um, I will pass it to Esther. Esther, yeah. Oh yeah, thank you, Cecilia. I just wanted to add, um, well, I'm, I, I don't know how to say this, but I feel like us Hispanics sometimes or at times, especially as we get connected to or get connected to our traditions and, and how we how we grew up, uh, generally we don't acknowledge or create the space for the importance of mental well uh, health. And um, I say that because I started the pandemic, like many of us jumped working from home. I'm ready to do this. So, OK, it's it's Zoom all day. After the holidays, I just hit a wall and it won. Like I, I, I was on the floor for about four weeks where I couldn't find myself with the strength to go back and be productive as I wanted to. But at the same time, how do I communicate this to my manager? How do I ask for help? How do I even say, hey, I am over here, but I'm not here really. So it took actually um, my manager to give me a call and check in with me and say, hey, how are you doing? I noticed these things, what's happening? And I was able to talk to her and share with her a little bit of the struggles that, um, that I was confronting and, and facing. And I think my message to connect with that question or to answer the question is just, um, you know, one, it's okay to not be okay. I think everything right now, it's just out of normal. Things are not necessarily the way we want it to. And two, um, if there is a need or if, you if you're not okay, then either find the strength to connect with your manager or the person in your team that may be able to listen. Because at the end of the day, you know, as leaders in our, in our organizations, our teams, we don't know necessarily what's happening behind the computer. We don't know what feelings are going through. We don't know the dynamics as well of what's happening at home. So I think it, it requires from us an extra step to be empathetic and create a space for people to share and be vulnerable. I know it won't be ideal many times. I know maybe some managers may not acknowledge this, but um, if you have the power, if you have the seat at the table to bring light to these issues and to bring you know, people around you or your team or your peers, um, do so because it goes a long way. And, um, and I think that applies no matter if you're you know, Latino, African-American, and, and any other community, so. I think a lot of our, our, you know, a lot of the communities of color, and, and I think everyone has just been impacted. You know, I, I resonate with what you said, how, you know, I you work so hard and then all of a sudden you crash and then you don't know how to tell your, you know, your bosses. The good thing is that I'm the boss, I can just tell the board, hey, I need a some time off. But sometimes, you know, I know that that's not the, you know, you don't have that, you, you know, and sometimes, you know, like someone says, you know, we were put in this vulnerable situation, 
where you know we have to advocate and speak up for ourselves and that's what you all did you you did that so um we're we're almost close to time and i want to you know i want to continue this great conversation and and the chats are amazing you know people are really they're resonating with this conversation i think there should be a part two right because <laughs> um i i didn't even read all the questions to be honest with you and and there's just so much um to share but uh, i'm going to say with the last question, how can we promote women in the workforce in, in our daily life? And in our daily life. I'd like to take that one or at least take a, 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 my perspective on it is to become allies and advocates for each other, right? And first know how you're showing up. And, and you know, if you're having a green day in meaning like you're ready to go, you're hundred percent on board and, and ready for that. Or if you're having a yellow day, you're like, I'm here, but I'm not all about here <laughs> or having a red day. And you're like, I'm struggling and I'm going to do my best to show up, but this is how I am. And being able to have that self-reflection and awareness to about how you're showing up and what your needs are, and you be able to recognize that and support your other women and help to empower them to feel that they have a voice and that if they are having a hard day, just being that support system and reaching out to each other and just being that, 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 that shoulder if you need it. Or again, if there's opportunity or there's perspective, again, sharing that opportunity, providing that support and providing a seat at the table should you have the privilege and the opportunity to be able to bring them to build their perspective, build their exposure and build their pie of building their performance, their image and their experience. And so I would say it's it takes a step. First, how are we showing up for ourselves and how are we showing up for others? And it's like the airbag, you know, the airplane situation. We can continue to fill in others, but if we're not filling in our own cup, we're not going to be able to do as much as we can or what we're capable of doing. And so I would say it takes that step every single day to make that conscious choice. And even as, as we all struggle with imposter phenomenon, right? No one is immune from it. It affects 70% of the world. Um, being able to recognize it in ourselves and being, again, that mentor and help others through that, um, that mental impact, right? It's not a diagnosis, it's not a medical, you know, syndrome of any kind, but it's just, there's meta mental impact of having that, that phenomenon affect us. And so it's being able to have those conversations without judgment, saying, how would you think about this differently? And, and just being that caring support to, again, all, all uh, rising tide raises all ships. And how can you be that person to help be that peer leader and that thought leader um, in regards to your, your, your female peers, associates, in every dimension thereof. So I would just say that's that's my perspective. And and thank you. I know that um, Alfonso came for a brief minute, but I want to thank you all as we as we end the uh, the celebration of Women's Month. Right. Um, I want to celebrate and and uh, applaud you all for all the work you're doing and for making it possible for uh, not just women to thrive, but everyone to thrive. And I think that's the the um, word equity means all right and so um, I want to thank you all for being here and, and making this conversation so impactful uh, Alfonso I'll, I'll give it up to you now thank you Jessica I want to thank you ladies for participating thank you everyone for for joining us I want to say thank you to Sandra and Chase for Business for being a great corporate partner and for being the the corporate partner for today's conversation stay safe and be well take care <laughs>